let's recenter ourselves because those of you that were here yesterday got a wonderful start to the conference with our friends from Dementia Minds sharing a bit about their journey. And Tipa now kicked us off this morning with the big picture of we are under the umbrella. Why are we under the umbrella? Who's under the umbrella? What are we doing under the umbrella? And so we're gonna go from this 30,000 foot view to a more drilled in view looking at one type of dementia, frontotemporal dementia. So I'm so thankful, those of you that saw the first session with Tipa, you also got to meet Ann Ferguson, who is gonna be sharing time with me over the next hour and a half that we get to spend together, talking about her journey living with frontotemporal dementia, because I can only share from a clinical social worker perspective, and Ann brings so much more to the table. So thank you, Ann, for being here. Um, <clears throat> as we kind of center ourselves and take a few deep breaths and think about narrowing down to this frontotemporal dementia focus, I want you to think to yourself, or maybe take a note if you're a note taker, or if you like to write in the chat, write in the chat, what is it that you know about FTD, frontotemporal dementia? What do you know about FTD? And what's your connection to FTD? So what's your connection? Because you had four breakout sessions that you could have chosen from, and you chose to come to this one. So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to think about that. And what do you know about it? And maybe it's that you don't know anything about it and that's fair too. But we're gonna dive into a lot of these pieces um, and maybe something that wasn't as evident in this segment because we did narrow it down to five minutes was the challenge with getting a diagnosis. So imagine that you have a family member who is in their mid forties and suddenly they are having changes in language or personality. And I'm curious if that person in their mid forties starts showing these symptoms, do you automatically think, I really should get this person to a neurologist? Or are you thinking something else? Chances are you're thinking, ooh, she's drinking too much or drugs or midlife crisis or something else yeah and so many folks as you're mm -hmm. saying end up seeing a marriage counselor yeah so just even this idea of getting the diagnosis what we see with FTD is that it takes up to three years to actually chase down what it is that we're actually dealing with and along the way families experience these misdiagnoses that can serious frustration and challenge in the meantime. So Anne, I'm gonna ask you, share a little bit about your journey, if you don't mind, your journey to getting a diagnosis. Okay, um, good morning. Hey, <laughs> it, I'm in the West Coast, so it's, it's like seven o'clock in the morning. Anyway, um, yes, I was, uh, diagnosed at age 48. Um, I'm 63 now. I'm probably one of their longest living um, patients at UCSF where Dr. Miller, you saw him from. Because um, most people don't live, their life expectancy is like five to eight years. Anyway, and um, in the beginning, I thought I was just stressed from work as a nurse. And then, so I quit a job and then I started another job thinking that would be better. And then I got fired from that job and I had never been fired before. So I was just kind of depressed in the beginning. And my husband and I were seeing a marriage counselor. And then the next thing I know um, the therapist told me, I think you're depressed. 
So she sent me to a psychiatrist to get medication and that didn't seem to help. So I went to another psychiatrist who said, oh, no, 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 you have, the reason it's not working is because you have bipolar disease. So then I started on some more medication and that seemed to help for a little bit. Then I tried to get another job. My kids were teenagers at the time. And I tried to um, get a, another job and in three months I got fired again, okay? And then my one son said, you know, you look, told my husband, mom's acting a little, little bit like grandpa, okay? And my dad, um, at that time, they didn't call it FTD or even Picks disease like some of you may know about. They actually called it very early on, they called it subcortical gliosis. And so um, my husband said, um, kind of woke up to the fact. And so I went to UCSF and they said, we believe that that's what you have. So it took about how long would you say, Anne? That Sounds took like probably a couple, three years or so going through all that stuff to get to that. So then and, I also saw a psychiatrist. My therapist sent me to a psychologist who did some mini mental tests and she said something's wrong, but I don't know what it is. Okay. So you had several people weighing in with various diagnoses and also throwing some medications at you along the way. Right. Yeah, at some point, at one point it was up to like uh, almost 10 different medications at one time. And they were all psych medications. I wasn't on any other type of medication, but yeah, so. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in the first session when Tipa asked you early on, were you aware that something was changing? Because so we, we talk about that fancy word, anosognosia, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, that idea that someone can't recognize those changes in themselves. Were you able to see that things were changing? I did not, I did. didn't recognize that there was a big change. You know, I was similar to the people in that video going like, you know, I'm so young, okay? It's like, I must, it, it just can't be that or whatever. But when uh, somebody at my husband's work said, you know, you might want to get her on social security disability just in case she can't go back to work. There's nothing wrong with applying. So I went ahead and I just agreed with my husband to apply for it. And anyway, and then when I saw the psychiatrist, they sent me to a psychiatrist, um, Social Security did, to have him do an evaluation. And in 10 minutes, he said to me, you cannot work. And I actually argued with him. I said, no, I can work. And my husband's just sitting there, just kind <laughs> of not, not doing much of anything. And I'm arguing with this guy. And he goes, no, 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 you cannot work. And it was the first time I have this awareness that somebody's seen something that I don't see because I did not know the guy. Yeah. <clears throat> so you had said that in the first session. I loved what you said. Social Security, they, these interviewers don't love to give away money. <laughs> they are looking yeah. for, yeah. for reasons to say that you can work, not that you right. can't work. Yeah. So for you, logically, you thought about that. You thought about this person's job is to really weed out anyone that might be kind of faking it or something. And even this guy is saying, I can't work. Yeah. 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 So for you, you used, you had that logic and, and that reasoning to go, wow, okay, if this is the case and they're saying I can't work, then ooh. Maybe something is going on here. Yeah. Yeah. So and then I. Go ahead. 
I was just going to say, and then I started noticing some things in the sense of like my son got in a car accident and he was fine, but I was like this guy that this woman was talking about her husband. It's like, so is he coming home for dinner or what, you know? And I, I just got focused and didn't seem to care much and had apathy and then I would get angry at certain times like there were, I was driving and went to a gas station and and uh, this woman cut me off I actually literally got out of the car and started pounding on her window and scared the crap out of her okay and I saw myself doing it okay but it's like I couldn't stop it it's like, why am I doing this? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, you're mentioning like this sense of lack of impulse control and this emp lack of empathy, yet you're seeing it and going, why am I even doing this? Right. And so for you, I'm wondering you were, you were compliant. You went to these doctor's appointments. I'm guessing this was led by your husband or your family to keep getting you to different doctors and, or by yourself. Was any advice that you have, because I know that a lot of folks are going to ask, what about the person who won't go to the doctor that won't, I mean, you, again, it took you three years and you were willing um, any thoughts, and maybe this is something that we can come back to if you'd like, thoughts on someone who is resistant to even going to see a provider to get a diagnosis? Well, I think the reason it's so difficult is because most people with this disease are in that 40, 40 to early 50 range. I mean, it expands even more. I know somebody that it was in her 30s, she died recently, and she was a pediatric physician with young children at home. And she died within about three years, okay? Mm -hmm. But because it's such a young type of dementia, there's a lot of denial in the fact that, that um, my whole life can't be stopping. Okay, I can't, the financial burden is so high. I, you know, it's like, this just can't be happening to me at this age. And so of course you get this denial of that they don't wanna to go to the doctor because there, it's not so much that they don't wanna to go to the doctor. It's just that they're in such a denial that there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. That's been yeah, my experience. Mm -hmm. So this idea of I'm young, what could this possibly be? It can't um, be that bad. Yeah. Yeah. It can't be that and, and bad. You know, I'm just tired. I'm just stressed at work. It can't be that bad because mm -hmm. when you're that young and then, you know, like this woman I just talked about that had the, um, there was a pediatric physician. I mean, look at all the years she put in going to school. Okay, and then her whole life turns around and not only can she not work anymore, she can't even take care of her kids anymore. So it's like it you're in this big denial of that because it's like your whole life, as opposed to somebody who has Alzheimer's, they've worked a whole life. And then and then they get uh, dementia at 65. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to talk as a social worker, certainly part of that family structure piece is really um, something that I want to talk about. And we will get to that a little bit later, as well as you, you have talked about your kids were in their teens, they were teenagers. So mm -hmm. certainly the mm -hmm. impact on the family system, very different. And I noticed, and I'm trying not to be too distracted by the chat, but I did notice that someone put earlier on um, that, and I wanted to highlight this, the, on the slide here I have that, so the rear view mirror, it's clear, we have the diagnosis and now we can say, okay, well that maybe explains 
some of these things that have happened. However, and I think it was Tammy who noted in the chat, sometimes there's been such damage to relationships and even maybe someone getting involved in the criminal justice system or you know, maybe finding themselves in jail or in psych hospitals that um, oftentimes what I've heard is the fractured relationships, even though we have this diagnosis and we're able to look in the rear view mirror and it explains it, sometimes the damage is done that can't actually be put back together. Yes, and I'm through sure a lot of people generally. Um, I, I lost just about every friend I had. Um, yeah, you, you end up burning a lot of bridges and my teenage sons were not, in fact, one of them recently said to me, and now he's 34, but it's like, he felt bad that he didn't have more compassion for me when when he was a teenager having a problem, okay? He, they would yell at me, all kinds of stuff, okay? Yeah. Beyond the normal teenage thing. <laughs> Good note there, yeah, because sometimes teenagers can be that way anyway. But yeah, so he's now looking in the rear view mirror and it sounds like saying, goodness, I would have handled that differently or I could have handled that differently if I had really known what was going on. Um, and you still have a relationship, whereas others, you, you know, you use the expression, you burn through a lot of relationships. Yeah, well, I had to work job. at it. It didn't come easy. I had to work at it. Yeah. So you had to work at rebuilding that relationship with your sons. Yeah. It's taken years, actually. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of kind of present and future support, and I'm going to stop sharing, <clears throat> excuse me, stop sharing my screen for a second. I have a friend um, who talks about having chased this diagnosis for years for her husband, and then finally getting the diagnosis, and then feeling this sense of relief that, okay, now I know what we're up against. And she calls that first year her hair on fire year. She says that the first year was just running around, putting out the fires. And then only after a really a year of putting out fires was she able to actually start helping him think for the future about what kind of support and they're building their team and all of that. Um, I'm curious if you had a similar experience of the hair on fire year or something else. Uh, not so much, I would say, for me yeah. anyway. But I know okay. other people who have done that, yes. So by the time you got that, that your diagnosis, you had a good team around you. You had gotten to the specialist. You had gotten to... Dr. Bruce Miller and the team at UCSF. And so at that point, did you feel like you had support for moving forward with your diagnosis? Well, the only thing they could tell me was that we believe that you have it, okay? You know, and so um, that went on for several years and I participated in I have participated in research for them for almost 15 years now. Wow. And um, about five years ago, they told me that because they, they draw blood and do other things while you're there. And Dr. Miller came to me and he said, I want to tell you, we did find, uh, we do have the results of a genetic test and he said, do you know, do you want to know what it is? And I go, yeah, okay. So he told me, he says, you know, you have this C9 gene, which I'm sure you're going to talk about later. And he goes, and how do you feel about that? I go, well, actually, I'm pretty happy about it because now I know for sure 
that's what's going on other than this pseudo thing of that you have, you think you have it. And so you mentioned the C9 gene. And so at that point, your father had also been involved in research as well, correct? Mm hmm And so- So they had his brain there from being there. And that's also how they compared it to what he had. Okay. So yeah, we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into those genes here in a little bit. And I wanna just kind of take us back to the kind of the big picture of what you all noted. So we're, we've talked a, a, quite a bit about diagnosis and um, the challenge that Anne and others experienced getting this diagnosis and how it can take years and whew, that right off the bat, I'm thinking for families, what a challenge that is. And as care providers for the professionals, in the room thinking about by the time someone gets to us and is reaching out for that support, recognizing that they've been through hell and back. Yeah. They've been through yeah. It's not, okay, I went to a neurologist one time and he said it's probable Alzheimer's. It's, it's been a few, a few years of chasing this diagnosis and, and that doubt and living with, is this or is this not? Or that's a, that's a long journey to go through. And then we get the diagnosis. Yeah, Mary? I'm sorry, um, go ahead and finish your thought, then I'll ask. Yeah, so then we get the diagnosis and we hear, okay, frontotemporal dementia. And that's where I wanted to go next is that when we hear this dementia, a lot of folks picture what? What do folks picture? Alzheimer's. Okay, so you have dementia, so you have memory problems. Okay. So I'm going to ask everyone to just use your imaginations for a second. So think about, we're going to take our, our mind out of dementia for a second and, and think about your own family. And you have a family member who has a horrible pain. They have an injury and it hurts and you want to do anything that you can to help them be relieved of this physical pain that they're having. And so you in your best interest, you tend to their knee, you really put a lot of attention and caring for that knee that you think's hurting. And, and you remember back from gym, from your gym class that there's a, that acronym RICE, rest, ice, compression, elevation. And you're really, you know, you're icing their knee. You've got one of those compression braces and you're elevating it and you're doing all this. You may even lead them through some knee exercises. You do everything you know to do to help them with this knee pain. Unfortunately, it's not the knee that hurts. You know what it is? They cracked a tooth and they've got a nerve exposed. So was your treatment, was your intervention helpful? No. Why? Why was that intervention? All that stuff that you did, you iced it, you elevated it, you compressed it, you, you even did some exercises. Why was that not helpful? We're treating the wrong thing. Ooh, yeah. So Mary's ahead of me here and she's putting what I'm, put, picking up what I'm laying down. So how does this relate to FTD gang? How does this relate? How does this silly analogy that I just came up with this weekend about a knee, I never said it was the knee at first. I said, your family member is in horrible pain and they're hurting. And then later I started talking about the knee. So how does this relate to what we're talking about? Oh, I see in the chat, I didn't listen or ask. So mm -hmm. one of Tipa's, um, well, let's call it a Tipa-ism, is, you know, assessment, not assuming. I didn't know what, what was happening with this person. 
So in the same way, when I just hear dementia and I think dementia equals Alzheimer's equals memory problems, then I'm going to approach someone like Anne, who is living with FTD, in a very different way than maybe what she needs from me. So, Mary, I don't know if what you were wanting to add was related to this or something else. Um, someone had asked, and I thought it might be interesting where we were talking, um, Anne is doing so well in this, is she participating in a trial? Um, but that might not be, you might want to address that at another time. Yeah, so thanks for bringing that up. We are, we are going to talk about that, absolutely. Okay. So we'll get to that okay. here in a minute. So when we think about this dementia equals Alzheimer's, which we know is not the right equation, but dementia is the umbrella, right? This whole conference is we're living under the umbrella. And that Alzheimer's is one type and there are many different types. We're really focused on four for our conference. And that memory changes is one symptom. Why do we always think about memory when we hear dementia, do you think? Because Alzheimer's number one in, in yeah. the dementia world. I mean, exactly. in the sense it's of how many people get dementia, it's the number one dementia, that's why. Yeah, so it's the most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's is, and it starts in the part of the brain that Mary's going to talk about here in a few minutes, the hippocampus. And so we often think about memory when we hear that someone has this diagnosis, but let me ask you, Anne, how is your memory? It's fine. Memory is not a hallmark of this disease at all. Yeah. So for Anne... Memory isn't a part of, memory issues aren't a part of your journey. So when we think about this Alzheimer's versus FTD, are there similarities? Yes, they're both dementias. The brain is changing. It's a gradual progression, but very different in these things that we're talking about. What part of the brain is impacted the age of onset and the family system and the structure and what resources are available and what we've talked so much about these misdiagnoses being common. So Mary is going to take us through some parts of the brain because I thought you might want to see a different face for a little while. So Mary's <laughs> going to take us through some TIPA hand motions. So those of you that have, oh, you've had one or two cups of coffee and you're thinking, oh, it's a good time for a mid-morning nap. Nope. Because Mary's going to do some hand motions with us. We're going to talk about why are the symptoms of FTD the symptoms of FTD. And it's because the part of the brain that's impacted. So the frontal temporal lobes versus oh, deep down in that hippocampus that we see as the first part of the brain that's impacted with Alzheimer's disease. So Mary, you want to lead us through some hand motions? We'll start. Yeah, you got it, Rebecca. Thank you. We're going to start with the hippocampus. Hippoc if you put your hands on the sides of your head and if you could go way down deep in the center of your head, your hippocampus is down in the middle of your head, down in the middle of your brain. It's part of your primitive brain. We have a primitive brain. We have a thinking brain. Primitive brain is the stuff that keeps the body going. And interestingly, most dementias love, it must taste good with ketchup because most dementias really love the hippocampus and it will go down there and cause some damage pretty early on. And the hippocampus, there are three big skills that we have in the hippocampus. And one of them is taking in new information and making it stick. So do this with me. Taking in information, learning information, making it stick. Learning information, making it stick. That's the first thing it does. The second thing it does is wayfinding. Do this with me. Wayfinding. That's getting myself from where I know to where I don't know. What's familiar to what's unfamiliar. It might be traveling. It might be 
walking. It might be some other way of going from familiar to unfamiliar and back again. There's the kicker, getting into unfamiliar and back again. So wayfinding, going from here to there and back again. And the third thing is time awareness. Time awareness. Now, time awareness could be several things. It might be the time of day. It might be elapsed time. How much time has it been since I've seen you? And it Mary, might also be the time of moment. my life. Mary, could I pause you yeah. just for one moment? We're having some folks that asked if you would just back up a little bit from the camera. They can't see all your hand motions. They just want to make sure they get what they need. Thank, thank you, you so much. It's, it's okay. done. Thank you for that. Great. Everybody can see me now. Thank you very much. Well, so I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna pause you right there. So great job, Mary. So we looked at this learn and remember. Also, this wayfinding from familiar to unfamiliar and back again, and also time awareness. So I'm just gonna ask Anne, thinking about these symptoms that are changes in the hippocampus, how you already mentioned that short-term memory wasn't really an issue for you. And I'm curious about time awareness and wayfinding, but I also want to pause and tell you, <clears throat> ask you to tell the group, on our very first Zoom meetings, we haven't actually had the pleasure of meeting in person, but our very first Zoom meeting, you said, and you you were humble, you didn't mean it in a in a braggadocious way, but you said, I was a real, I, I'm a really smart, high functioning person. And you said, if most people are like right about here, I functioned up here. Like I was, I was a, a really high functioning. So my baseline <laughs> was most people, you know, my, my now is most people's normal, but my baseline was here. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Just, I, I was blown away by your ability to talk about now after 15 years, I'm yeah. still at about yeah. where most people are normally. What, what I was trying to say was that this is normal, whatever. And, and what I meant by up here, highly functioning was that I had like three jobs, two kids, and I was going back to school. That's what I mean by by almost overachiever, okay? And so when I got sick, I came down to what the average person does. And so most people go, who didn't know me before, they, they go, you don't seem so bad. Because the people that are here, they get the disease and go down here. It's really obvious. Yeah. So knowing you're a brilliant person, you're a super achiever, you were able to manage all these things. And now after 15 years of living with FTD, some people will still might wonder if, if that's something that you even have. And I know that you've mentioned people question you if you have FTD or not. Yeah. Well, you know, I have learned, you know, part of the thing is, I have learned over the years too how to read the room, how to read people. And I go, that would not be a good thing to say it right now. Or um, I shouldn't have said that or whatever. And, and I've learned, I've adapted. I have learned how to read people and read the room. And, but it's exhausting. You have no idea how exhausting that is. Um, yeah, because it's so, you. It's like learning a foreign language where you have to interpret what what they said to you in English, and then talk back to them, say in Spanish. It's kind of the same thing. It's exhausting having to do that, interpret it, and then redo it again. Yeah, so that's really interesting. And you said that your husband, you told me in another conversation that your husband actually has a word that he use, uses to describe that, that hard work that you're doing behind the scene in your brain. What does he call it? Um, I forget. What did I tell you? I don't remember now. Is it masking or something? 
So kind of masking. Yeah. You're adapting. Well, I just adapt and mask the symptoms as as yeah. much as I can. And so why do you why do you do that? Why do you work so hard behind the scenes to adapt? Because there's a lot of stigma behind dementia. And um, I don't want people dismissing me, looking at me weird, um, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I do that. So you are aware of the stigma and you're thinking, I don't want to be put in this box that someone might less informed might put me in a box when they hear my diagnosis. Yeah. So after a day like this and talking about this and you say it's exhausting, well, what will tonight be like for you? Um, I'm not too guarded today because this is a dementia workshop. So I'm not as guarded today. So it's not as exhausting for me in that sense. Okay. So today wouldn't be as bad as usual. Yay, so I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so excited to hear you say that Yatipa talks about the four Fs of our environment. If anybody can write in the chat, I'd love to hear what the four Fs. And what Anne is describing is this is an environment that meets those four Fs. Nobody's getting to it, so I'm gonna have to pull it out. So it's fr ooh, friendly, familiar, functional, Oh, nice job, Missy. And I was her mentor, so yay. <laughs> Friendly, familiar, functional, and forgiving. And so Anna is sharing that, oh, guess what? This isn't a day that she's going to feel really worn out because she doesn't feel like she's having to mask or adapt because this is where she can just say, this is who I am and this is what I'm living with. Nice. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Because you did talk about how exhausting that can be. And I, yes. I wanted yes. to, I hope that you wouldn't feel that way. But so with these symptoms, so this time awareness, this wayfinding, I'm doing it all very fast. Sorry, gang. The time awareness, the wayfinding that Mary led us through, and the learning and remembering, those aren't really symptoms that you have because that's not the part of your brain that's being impacted. Right, so Mary, some things that look like memory have to do more with orientation instead. Like if I go to the grocery store, I will look at, um, I don't know, say, say it's Safeway. I will look at the S, that's the row I parked on. So when I get back, to the car, I go and see, where did I park my car? I look at the S and I can find my car. But that has nothing to do with memory. That has to do with orientation and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And that so- has to do with the frontal brain, yes. Interesting, yeah. And so I'm gonna actually steal that tip because I often can't find my car. So thank you for that. That was Good. worth the price of admission. So <laughs> thank you, Anne. So Mary, how about some hand signals? So what are the functions of this prefrontal cortex and these temporal lobes? And thanks for adjusting yourself so we can see you a little bit better because these hand motions, why does Tipa use these hand motions, gang? Why do we do all this hand stuff? Because it helps us learn and remember. It helps it stick. Cool, so it reinforces Missy's saying and retention, yeah. So let's go, Mary. Tell us about the prefrontal okay. cortex. Everybody put your hand up here. Prefrontal cortex, the last part of your brain to form. Women get it usually in their early 20s. Guys are still waiting for it. Oh, sorry. 
Um, last part of your brain, higher thinking skills. So we're going to start with taking data, figuring it all out, and cha-ching, reaching some sort of logical, rational, rational, reasonable conclusion. So taking in data, cha-ching, reaching a logical conclusion. The second one is making decisions, using my judgment to make decisions. Should I or shouldn't I? Do I or don't I? The third thing, whoa, impulse control, pulling back on the reins. We learned when we were at our mother's knee that we could not say or do anything that popped in our heads in the moment. That's impulse control. Whoa, pulling back on the reins. The next thing is sequencing, starting a task, sequencing through it in order, stopping the task, and being able to move on. So starting a task, moving through it in order, stopping it, and being able to go to something else. The next thing is self-awareness, being able to look at myself, look at my abilities, look at my limitations, what can I do? What can I not do? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? Self-awareness, looking at yourself. And right on the heels of that, looking at someone else, being able to look at their perspective, looking at somebody else's point of view. So we're going to start at the beginning of all of that, starting with logical thought, taking in data and cha-ching, making some logical conclusions. The next one is, right, decision making. The next one is, whoa, impulse control. The next one is sequencing through a task and being able to move on. The next one is looking at myself and looking at someone else. That's what the prefrontal cortex does. Anybody want to say anything about that before we move on to the left and right temples? Rebecca, are we where we need to be? Yeah, so Missy's asking well, if we could do it one more time even. So everybody, if you haven't done so at home, stand up because you may have an opportunity to actually not be on the receiving end of this sometime. You might be in a place where you want to explain these functions of the prefrontal cortex. So we want you to practice here in this safe environment, doing these hand signals. And so Mary, could you lead us through that just one more time? Got it again, here we go. We're starting with. So move your hand around in a circle like this. So you're coming and then up. And what does that mean with Mary for you? Taking in data and cha-ching, coming to a reasonable, rational conclusion. Taking in data, cha-ching, reaching a reasonable, rational conclusion. Logical thought is a short way of putting this one. Bringing it in, making a good conclusion. Got that one. Okay, the next one, pretty easy to see this one. Decision making, being able to so take that. So you're putting out two hands in front of us. So is it this mm -hmm. or this? Making decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay, got decision making. The next one. Whoa. Everybody don't do that. Whoa. 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 This, this is what you do when you drive past the uh, Krispy Kreme donut shop and the hot donut sign is on and you don't pull into the parking lot. Impulse control. Impulse control. This is when or somebody that other comes. Another glass of wine, Mary, right? <laughs> I've, I've never had that experience, certainly not never. had that experience. Uh -huh. Or somebody comes in the room wearing a really ugly outfit and you don't say anything about it. Things that you learned at your mother's knee that you can't do just in the moment. The okay. next one. So put your hand out here. Now we're going to start, right? Sequence. Sequence through. I'm making coffee. I have to get the the filter. I have to put the cough, put the filter in the machine. I have to put coffee in the filter. I have to put water in the machine. I have to turn it on. If I don't do any of that in the proper order, 
then I'm having trouble with sequencing. Sequencing through stopping the task and being able to move on to something else. Sequencing through stopping the task, moving to something else. Got that one? Okay, next one, looking in the mirror. Seeing myself for who I am and what I can do, what my abilities are, what I'm good at, what I'm not so good at, self-awareness, looking in the mirror. And the last one is turning that mirror out and seeing somebody else's point of view. Oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. Oh, I see what you mean. That is seeing somebody else's perspective. Okay, did we get them? Nice job. So you are talking about the prefrontal cortex, which is one of the areas of the brain that we're thinking of with frontal temporal dementia. Frontal, everybody do this, frontal temporal. Frontal lobe, temporal lobe. It's a combined fancy word to talk about. These are the areas of the brain that are being impacted. Like maybe if Alzheimer's was called hippocampal disease or something. So <clears throat> we're talking about the front part of the brain. So before we go to the temporal lobe, Mary, I'm wondering if Anne can talk about you're hearing those six functions of the prefrontal cortex. And you had talked earlier about that gas station experience where you were knocking on the lady's window and thinking, this isn't even something that I would normally do. Impulse control, it sounds like, was a big piece of that. Any of these other six functions that you're feeling like, oh, I identify with that? Um, well, somebody mentioned in the thing about executive thinking, it has mm -hmm. to do with um, judgments of I spent a ton of money in the beginning that we didn't have. I mean, I bought videos, all kinds of videos online and my husband's going, what are you doing? Okay, I just couldn't stop buying. You know, I would, I bought almost couple thousand dollars worth of stuff and um yeah about talking about impulse judgment um uh, coordinating a sequence of things mm -hmm. i didn't see the beginning from the end or the end from the beginning um yeah Okay. I was a lot worse off than I am now, and I don't know why. Okay. So Nobody interesting. Knows. Yeah. Well, and even Dr. Miller said, I think, wow, you. Yeah. You last time I lot. was there, last time I was there, he sent his, uh, he, he sent his um, assistant down to talk to me. He says, she says, he wants to talk to you. He wants to know why it is you, you think you got better or whatever, because my tests were better, all kinds of stuff were better. And he wants to find out. And so, yeah, he talked, came and talked to me. You know, he's a busy guy. Okay. He came and talked to me for about 15 minutes to ask me why it is he heard I was here and why it is I got better. I have no idea. Hmm. So early on, when you first started having these symptoms, you um, you you talked about the spending, and I'm curious because that also kind of leads into that um, logical reasoning piece. That were you thinking at all about, well, this is not a good choice for our financial situation to be spending these this money on these videos. I I just didn't think about it. Okay. It yes. just wasn't it just wasn't there. And at one point I bought like all kinds of towels. My husband said you bought like five hundred dollars worth of towels and then threw them away and bought some more. 
And at some point, he put a limit on the credit cards and stuff. So I couldn't overspend. That's what he did. Okay. So he found a way to kind of work with you and kind of managing that as best as he could. You and I had talked about a lot of times folks who are living with frontotemporal dementia have these um, repetitive actions, repetitive, um, maybe an OCD type, almost even compulsion to do things. Um, and some of the videos and those of you that have asked, I will put the 60 minutes link in the chat um, it, before we end our time together. Also, there's a great video that, <clears throat> excuse me, the Association for Frontotemporal Dementia who are, or Degeneration, excuse me, the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration who they are actually sponsors of this conference. So thank you to the, the AFTD. Um, they have a great video called It Is What It Is. And it goes through four families um, journey with the FTD. It's a, I think it's a 17 minute video and definitely worth um, taking time to watch that if you haven't seen that already. Um, and it does show a bit more than what we saw in the 60 minutes clip. Some of these compulsive behaviors that people experience oftentimes with FTD maybe pacing in the same um, circle or around the same block of their neighborhood. Or, or eating. eating or eating or whatever. It's like you're full, but you don't know. It's like, it's like you got to have something oral going on all the time, that kind of thing. You know, I actually gained quite a bit of weight. I've lost quite a bit of weight. I've lost two sizes. Okay, in clothes or whatever, from the beginning of just overeating, basically. And, and I'm curious because a lot of times it's one specific food. It's usually some kind of carbohydrate. You know, it's usually cookies or that kind of thing. Those are the kind of things I hear a lot of. of, of the friends that I have in the dementia world of FTD, they complain about that a lot. It's about all the kind of sweets and stuff. Mm -hmm. So some of us, and I'm sure I'm not alone, have learned um, that putting food in our mouth can sometimes provide comfort. Anyone else ever recognize mm -hmm. that? Yeah. So, yeah, and so, but with, with FTD, a lot of times we see this compulsion towards one particular type of food. And, you know, I remember my, one of my early mentors that I worked with, Dr. Jerry Hall in Phoenix, Arizona, um, talked a lot about how to work with these compulsions um, and not trying to stop it, but work with it. And an example that we dealt with with a family was this a um, woman who was eating like 10 boxes of Cheerios a day. She had to have the Cheerios. She had to have Cheerios. And so the family thought, well, you know what? If we just don't have Cheerios in the house, she won't eat them. <laughs> you're shaking your head, Anne. You're, you're, you're no, noticing. You, know, you find a way to get it. It, it That's what it is. Cause, because you know what you're she so did? young. You can just walk out the door or whatever and go down to the store. And I know people that have been in jail, even because of this, they'll go down there and if they don't have any, they'll just steal it. And yeah. in that, in that video you talked about, it is what it is. There's a guy in there who comes home with a bike, a, 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 a bike and wants, and his wife wants to know, why it is, where he got the bike from and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so this compulsion to whether it's take things or eat. And so one of the symptoms that we often see with frontotemporal dementia is this hyperorality. And you talked about your weight gain and that's, that's so common early on that folks put on a lot of weight early with FTD. And there's a, also another word that we hear often with FTD, and that's the word pica. 
pica. So this is the term that's used in Anna's and nurse, you know this, eating non-food items. Right. So right. going back to the woman with the Cheerios, you said, you're right. She's young and strong and she was going to find this item that she wanted to put in her mouth. But when the Cheerios weren't in the house, she actually went to the garage and found little nuts and bolts that looked like Cheerios. Mm -hmm. And so guess what? The family decided maybe the 10 boxes of Cheerios isn't, isn't so bad after all. I mean, it's not ideal. But let's be the real. video that you're going to show in the end. There's a guy drinking, and you can just time it. It's so repetitious. When you see that, it's just you can almost time it. Yeah, that. Yeah, you're exactly right. And thank you for reminding me because I want to make sure I leave time for that. Anne was really instrumental in helping shape that we were going to start with the video and we were going to end with a video too. So yeah, we're, we're going to show mm -hmm. kind of the after show or the overtime of that 60 minutes piece. So, so back to these symptoms that make FTD different from Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. You also talked about, and I want to have Mary talk about our temporal lobes, but one other thing that that Mary taught us in our hand motions is this idea of seeing it from someone else's perspective. And you had shared an, an experience where your son had been in, in an auto accident and that empathy piece. Can you talk about that? Yeah, there's a difference between <laughs> empathy and apathy, okay? And apathy has to do with, I don't care, and empathy is, I don't feel it, basically. And so I didn't have a lot of feelings in the beginning. They were really stunted. In fact, I would even go to the movies to see, um, I would go to the movies to see a thriller or a horror movie just so I could feel something because I felt actually nothing. And I still have that problem but it's not as strong. And I have learned again, adapted, how to fake it. I will even laugh at something that somebody says because other people are laughing, even if I don't feel it. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's the difference. I mean, the apathy is really strong too, but it's not as much as the empathy. You just so you really actually, don't feel feel it at all. But it you sounds like feel. you miss it. So you find yourself, you put yourself in situations where you're going to feel that strong emotion. So if it means going to a thriller movie. Right. That's what I would do to actually feel something for a change. Because I didn't feel happy. I didn't feel sad. I didn't feel anything. So you found a way to have some kind of strong emotion, right. even if it's right. like a fight or fright kind of emotion that we talk exactly. about with that amygdala. Interesting. So people think because you don't feel it, you don't care. It's not about not caring. It's about you just don't feel it. Or, you know, you want to cry, but you can't cry. Huh. It gets to that point, too. So this idea that it's not that I don't care, it's just the part of my brain that helps me really feel that is changing. Right. And so that's part of the relationship building, I'm guessing, that you've had to work on with people in your life to say, listen, this is part of my diagnosis in the same way that if I didn't have legs you wouldn't ask me to get up and walk across the room and because part of my disease process part of my frontal temporal dementia is this it's not that I don't care I truly do care and the, the you know the positive for you Anne is that you're able to verbalize that and put that into words whereas for many care partners maybe the person living with dementia can't put that into words. And so there's this disconnect 
that really creates a lot of challenges in the situation. And I just want to pause for a second because we're, we're, we're in the final countdown. My colleague MMC would probably start singing now the final countdown. I won't do that to you, but we are at 28 minutes. But I want to say, Anne, and I haven't been keeping up with a ton of the chat because I want to be focused with our conversation. But someone just said they so appreciate your sharing. So I just wanted to time out with that. We really appreciate it. This is so valuable for us. So thank you. Mary, how about you dive into those temporal functions, temporal love functions? We'll hit those real quick so we have time for this video. Left temporal lobe, everybody put your hand, left temporal lobe. Left temporal lobe is language. This is where my language center is. And this is sort of like three parts of this. It's what I hear, my comprehension. It's not just my hearing. It's how I process what I hear. So my comprehension and my word finding. I'm having trouble with finding words. And I'm having trouble with speech production, coming up with words, being able to say the words correctly. So let's go back and look at that. Comprehension, what I'm hearing, right in here. Word finding, speech production. Those are the three parts that pretty well cover language. So am I going to have trouble understanding what you say or understanding what I'm trying to say? And this is where we get into aphasia, and Rebecca's going to get into a whole lot of that. So that takes care of left temporal lobe. One more time, guys. Left temporal lobe, comprehension, what I hear, finding words, speech production, what I say. Got that one. Anything you want to talk about with language? Okay. There it is. That was language. Other side, right side. This is the fun side. Right temporal lobe, this is where rhythm lives, rhythm. We love rhythm. So what lives with rhythm? That covers music, dance, poetry, because poetry has a rhythm to it. The rhythm of my speech. My speech has rhythm, rhythm in all forms, music, poetry, Prayer has rhythm. Counting has rhythm. All of those things. So rhythm in the right temporal lobe, which is really great. Part of rhythm and part of what's in my right temporal lobe, these are the things that are retained. Left side, eh, I was losing that. This is the stuff that's still there. Part of what's still in here is social chit-chat. Hey, how you doing? How's the family? Beautiful day. Yeah, looking good. You're looking good. Hey, looking good. I can do that all day long. Social chit chat. Have I got that one? All righty. And the last piece of this one is uh, maybe not so much rhythm as it is forbidden words. Forbidden words. These words are the words that you learned when you were five years old and you heard somebody say this word that you've never heard before and it sounded like a cool word and you used it at your mother's dinner table and you were sent to bed without supper and your brain said, oh, that's special. I think I'm going to store that over here in my special vocabulary, not over here in my usual everyday vocabulary. Well, now dementia has affected my language center, so I can't get to those words. But guess what I can get to from my right side? Forbidden words. So, right temporal lobe, rhythm, music, prayer, and counting. Rhythm, music, prayer, and counting. Got it? Social chit-chat. Forbidden words. That pretty well covers us for that one. Rebecca, you're back. Nice job. So, and what's the song that Tifa, Tifa teaches us about? Language on the language left. Language on the left, rhythm on the right. You lose on the left, 
you retain on the right. You want to do that one again. Language on the left, rhythm on the right, you lose on the left, you retain on the right. Now, as I'm looking at myself on Zoom, I realize it's looking backwards. God help you people having to turn this backwards. <laughs> I think that's one of the mysteries of Zoom that it only looks like that for you. One of the so. mysteries, that's right. That's it. <laughs> so what does that mean? So Mary took us through the functions of the left temporal lobe, which is where we tend to lose first in most forms of dementia. And it was that vocabulary, speech production, and comprehension. The vocabulary, speech production, and comprehension. So I want to dive, and I'm not going to get too technical, guys, because you know what? I'm a social worker. I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV. But I am going to just kind of briefly talk about these presentations. So what do you think it means when I say a presentation? So that's what we see. This is what we call a clinical presentation of what we are seeing, the symptoms that we're seeing in someone. So you see here three clinical presentations, the behavioral presentation, language presentation, that means that's what we're seeing first is these changes in language or movement changes. And we haven't talked a lot about that, these movement changes when that motor part of the brain starts to be impacted. <clears throat> what you hear about most are the behavioral variant and these primary progressive aphasias. So now we went from presentation, meaning this is what you're seeing clinically first. And these are the actual subtypes or the diagnoses that a doctor may say it's probable, like Anne said, for months, it's probable behavioral variant FTD until they found that gene and were able to really narrow down. So these are the subtypes. Behavioral variant, what are we thinking? Starting here in this frontal lobe that, that we've talked about those functions of the brain, the primary progressive aphasias, and there's three types because we said there were three skills here in that part of the brain. So you can dive deeper in at theaftd.org and find more information on these subtypes. One that impacts word finding abilities first, one that impacts speech production, and one that impacts comprehension first. So they're named or categorized by the symptoms that we see first. Similarly, like with Alzheimer's disease, does it stay in the hippocampus? Does that damage stay locked into the hippocampal region of the brain? No, we know that it spreads to other areas of the brain. And in the same way with the frontotemporal dementias or these subtypes of FTD, we also see that it starts in this area, but impacts other areas of the brain as it progresses. I worked in hospice care for five years and had the, had the privilege of working with folks at end of life, all with living or living with dementia, now on hospice, dying with dementia. And what I noticed at that point in the journey across the board was that we weren't really able to notice the difference between someone with FTD versus Alzheimer's versus Lewy body versus vascular, because TIPA talks about the four truths of dementia and seeing that they are progressive, that by the time someone reached our services at end of life, the deterioration had gone through other parts of the brain. This is really important for us to know early on what type of dementia does someone have so that we can best support them through the journey? But we know that these are progressive degenerative diseases. So Anne, a couple of things that I have notes here for myself to remember um, on these subtypes, and I'll keep this up for just a second longer, um, is that there are certain genes that are linked 
certain known genes that are linked to FDD. And this is actually making it more complicated at looking at treatment and finding a cure. It makes it more complicated, but we also know that there is so much research going on. And Dr. Miller said in the video, you know, hopefully, I think he said within the next five years, um, that there's so much research going on. So can you tell us about your involvement in, in research studies? Um, I'm, well, in the research studies, they do all kinds of different things, okay? They do many mental tests. They do different types of MRIs. They do spinal taps. Is this what you're asking me? Spinal taps, those kind of things. Um, and you know, they change over the years, you know, there'll be also, there'll be eye tests and stuff like that. One of the eye tests that they did the last time I was there, I saw pictures on the wall and I said to him, what is looking for, for instance? And he said, what they have is that there's this blue type of hue on the back of the retina that tells us that uh, with even without a blood test, you may have the progranulin gene, okay, which is another gene. Three types of main genes like MAPN and then C9, FOR72 and, and progranulin. Those are the ones that they know the most about. But in those subtests, they also have different proteins, TPA. TPN 42, 43, um, tau, some other ones. And so it makes it very complicated in order to treat somebody in those areas. So you're looking at the genes, these known genes, and then also these proteins that makes the kind of the picture even more complicated. And you've yeah. identified that they found the C9 gene Right, and they have the TPA43 protein also. So can you put that in the layman's terms? You're a nurse, that makes more sense to <laughs> you. Can you tell us what that means? Well, what it is is that they, they have certain type of genes and they have certain types of proteins. And then some of them are, are more common with certain types of genes, certain type of proteins that they put together. For instance, in the Alzheimer's world, they have EPO, EPO4, is it? Yeah. Yeah, APO. They have, like, they have like one gene, more or less. In FTD, there are several types that they know of, and that's what so makes far. it more complicated. Yeah, okay. So, Man, the time, I just feel pressure by this, but I, I did wanna mention, because people are gonna have access to the slides that we put together for today's presentation. And one of the things that we included in that was, I said, as a social worker, this is kind of what I go back to, kind of the family structure and the developmental stage of the family and the financial impact. So a couple of things I wanted to, to touch on before we show the final video and wrap us up. Um, you are actually a caregiver as well, right? Can you tell the yes. group about that? Uh, yeah, my mother is legally blind and she also has vascular dementia. And um, so I kind of care for her too. <laughs> what makes it difficult because two dimensions don't make a right. <laughs> so two dimensions don't make a right. So your mother is actually living with you. So uh, for, again, this is where FTD being so different that your age means that your mom's still living and now she has dementia. So you find yourself in a care partner role for her while also living with dementia yourself. Yes. Which is quite unusual. You don't meet very many, you know, 80 year olds living with Alzheimer's who are caring for a parent still. So you've got kids in your thirties, as well as your mother who's 88 and living with you. 
Very, very different than what we typically think of the family structure of someone living with dementia when we still think dementia equals Alzheimer's, which I think we've right. blown that up today. What about, and so I wanna just say that <clears throat> um, we've, we wanted to touch on the compassionate allowance too, because if that is something that you guys haven't heard about in our audience today, this um, access to social security disability insurance based on a diagnosis of FTD. And so Google compassionate allowances and you're gonna find that there is a way to actually fast track those resources. And Anne, you and your family did that as well, correct? Right, what it is is that in, for one thing um, in some states, they have state disability. In California here, they have state disability. You have to know if you had work for if your state has state disability. That's one thing. And you can apply for that. In the meantime, while you're applying for social security disability and FTD is one of those things on the list of compassionate allowance. And if you have it done right uh, through a doctor, whatever, upright, you can fast track it a lot sooner. So meaning that you can gain access to those Social resources. Security, disability a lot sooner. Nice. And so that was and when I you talked about. Yeah, and I don't really recommend to, I know a lot of people, a lot of my friends who have FTD, some of them have tried to use um, uh, attorneys to help them fast track it or whatever. And they just lost a lot of money doing it that way. So it's not necessary always to have to go through an attorney. You found that you could actually, and right. others in your situation have been able to do that and, and access that service or that support without having to use an attorney. So certainly something for folks to look into. Right. And also tomorrow in the young onset section, breakout session, I'll be talking more about that um, because it is really something that we want younger folks to know is available for them. So if you come to that session, you'll hear more about that as well. Could you tell the group about this new creative side that has come as a, a benefit for you for having FTD? Um, yeah, in the next segment, I think with Amanda, we're gonna be talking about that. But basically, the, the brain likes to, when one part of it's not working, likes to uh, another part of the brain to kind of take over. So in what you were saying about the creative side being on the right side and the left side being more logical or whatever, I was a nurse and more logical, whatever. And now my brain has gone more into the creative side. So I have written articles i wrote a book even through all this and everything on this creative side anything else you'd like to add in our final two minutes and i'm gonna put these links in the chat that people are asking for i just want to say that that don't assume i noticed in the video too that they said he's not really there i just mm -hmm. want to say that we are really there. It's just that you can't see that we're really there. My father, he was catatonic at times. And then all of a sudden, he would come out of it and talk about what happened two days ago. So just don't assume that they're really not there. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because that really caught my attention too. And I think from a PAC perspective, we always talk about what remains. Um, yes, there are changes, but even in what Mary talked about with the temporal lobes, what's lost and what's retained that we can really hold on to. And I think you've, you've shown us, Anne, that today, that there's a whole lot retained um, and you're able to share your experience and help us see from someone else's perspective. And so 
I know the chat's going crazy with people thanking you, but I want to thank you for your time and for sharing your journey. And I know that people will want to see you in the next segment in the panel and in the next segment with Amanda. <laughs> so thank you for giving of yourself so much today. Thank you everyone for your time and attention. Hi, I'm Tifa Snow. And you just found our YouTube channel and watched one of our videos. I'm the owner and founder of Positive Approach to Care. Thanks for watching. And if you liked, if you have a comment about, or you would, please share it with people you know. Oh, and if you haven't yet done it, consider subscribing. We'll let you know when the next new video comes out. And you might want to visit our website, www.tipasnow.com, where you'll find other resources as well. See you there.